But speaking of what's uh, out there, well, Ian, comment about what's in development. Well, you know, it's an exciting time for us. But comment on it specifically as it relates to Dravet and LGS on what's, up, what's on the horizon. Yeah. So we spoke a little bit uh, earlier about how much more homogenous Dravet syndrome is and the SCN1A link. And thankfully, there is just a burgeoning field of genetic therapies for pediatric disease and neurological disease in particular. So following on the effective treatments for um, SMA, you know, we're starting to think about oligonucleotides as possible therapeutic agents to treat uh, Dravet syndrome and potentially LGS if there's a specific gene that's identified in any particular patient. Um, we're also looking at things uh, that affect read through. So if there's a stop code on there, are people and um, investigators looking at whether or not you can increase expression of that gene and have it read through the, the stop codon. We're also looking at um, adenovector associated delivery systems. You know, there's a lot of different strategies for gene therapy, but ultimately it all fits under the gene therapy umbrella, which is incredibly exciting because it finally gives us an opportunity to treat the underlying cause of the epilepsy and more importantly, part of the underlying cause of the learning and cognitive and behavioral problems, which are affected by the epilepsy, but which probably have a direct contribution from the gene mutation itself. Elizabeth, anything more on the horizon that you want to mention or that you know of is, is exciting to you? No, I just agree with Ian. I think we're, we're in a transition from just treating seizure types, and I think we need to continue to do that since we have a lot of patients with unmet need with treatment of seizures. But I think it's extremely exciting for us, for the patients, for the patient communities, that now we are beginning to think, if Dravet is an SCN1 mutation, can we target it specifically? If tuber sclerosis is due to a mutation one of these two genes, can we target that specifically? Um, so I think that that is kind of where I think just the beginning of an explosion of generic genetic therapies for many of our kids with refractory epilepsy. Are there any other medications uh, or medication trials upcoming that people should be aware of for lennox gastaut syndrome and Dravet? So there is an ongoing trial looking at uh, TAC-935. Um, I think those results are not out yet, so we will see what, what that looks like. It's a novel mechanism, but um, it is not sort of one that is precision that you have talked about, and I, I think that's where the excitement really is for me, is, is really being able to target um, where the pathogenesis is and, and what is actually causing the seizures plus the other um, developmental issues that go along with these. And I think it's wonderful that these two syndromes have garnered such attention that has allowed for treatments to be discovered and, and for these children in need. I think there's still a large gap that we still have to undo and obviously meet for our families and our patients, but uh, we're heading in the right direction. So Eric, what advice would you give community neurologists that are treating patients with Dravet syndrome or lennox gastaut syndrome? Well, one is that it, uh, first, based on, on uh, the current perception, is that you are treating a lot of them. Be aware that they're in your practice. So um, for the patients that are refractory to treatment, that don't have the label, go back, and if those patients have childhood onset epilepsy, they could have lennox gastaut If they have generalized tonic seizures, they could have lennox gastaut If you want to use the refractory epilepsy screening tool for LGS, just get it and put it in your desk, and you can identify a few of them. Our job right now, even though we don't have every specific treatment for every specific patient, we have some treatments that work for a large percent of the heterogeneous population, and our job is to match them. So try to remove some of the medications that can exacerbate the syndrome. Try to match them with these wide spectrum treatments that work for many. And, uh, and then again, you know, uh, trying to, to provide support to this family. I think uh, the, the foundation, the, both the Travay and the Lennox has taught do a much better job than I can do in my limited time with the family face to face. So for me, just to connect, it makes a big difference for them. Well, this has been extremely informative. Before we end this discussion, I'd like to get final thoughts from each of our panelists. Ian, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I think there were a couple things that were said by some other panelists that I think relate to one another. Um, you know, I think. Uh, Eric was talking about the idea of the diagnoses as being a movie rather than a still life. I think that was a really eloquent way to say it. And that, combined with kind of what Elizabeth was saying here at the end, relates back to the transition, I think, a little bit from syndromes, which are obviously still incredibly important, 
two etiologies, right? And so to me, the end of the movie hopefully does have a happy ending, but I'm a little bit suspicious that the happy ending will come after the final act, which is gonna be genetic diagnoses for the patients that have epilepsy. And I guess the one thing that I think is incredibly important for all neurologists is to do the genetic testing as a panel so that you can identify these where they exist and give them gene-appropriate therapies. Not only identify them, but also make sure that you've done research to see if there's gene therapies going on because there is an incredibly surprising amount of investigation going on and there might be an investigational trial available. Elizabeth, final thoughts. So I think the past four or five years have been really exciting times. Um, it's been great fun for us to participate in these trials and see a lot of our kids do well. I, I think a, a big take home message for all of us though is that transition to adulthood because I know spending a lot of time talking to the advocacy, com, um, advocacy groups, there really is a significant underdiagnosis of LGS and Dervé in the adult population. And I think now that we have these medications that can benefit these individuals, um, I think it's really important to raise awareness in the adult epilepsy and neurology community that they do, like you said, they do have patients with this. And lots of times the early child history might not be available, but I kind of, if you have an adult sitting there, if they're still wearing a helmet or if they're having frequent seizures, if they have intellectual disability, that patient very much likely does have LGS, may have Dravé. Um, and could likely benefit from these new treatment modalities. It's not unusual for me to meet an adult with epilepsy who has not had a medication change in many years and yet is still having seizures. Uh, so I think to, to kind of help make the adult neurology community aware that, hey, these people could really benefit from these medications that now are available, that can be effective and appear to be very safe and well tolerated is really an important message. Elaine, how about you? So I think just going back to, uh, to what Ian has said, I think in adult neurology, um, I think become familiar with those gene panels and utilize those gene panels. I think that can be very, very um, helpful. Many of our patients, in, or many of the patients in the adult side have had neuroimaging um, and they don't have a lesion, but what they have not had is the, are the, the gene panels and I think that can really help with making a diagnosis. Um, I think the other thing that I've seen in the last five years is a lot of hope. Um, these are terrible, terrible epilepsies. They have very significant impact on quality of life of the child, of the family. I think we were actually sitting in a position where um, hopefully shortly in the next five, 10 years, we are going to see a, a really increased development of precision therapies that are really gonna target the underlying cause of these. And each of them is gonna be rare and it's gonna be you know, incredibly important for us to collaborate. This cannot be done in one center, in one silo. We really need to collaborate to make this happen. But I think it, uh, I think there's a lot of good things on the horizon. Eric. Well, I, I think that with both, with Lennox Stott and Dravé, it is clearly a hard situation. Hardest for the patient and the family, less for us, but hard. And, uh, and clearly, if you look at the diagnosis of epilepsy, we can make 60, 70% of people seizure free. The target is a little lower with LGS and Dravé, but it's not zero. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of patients that return to life that have the, the happy ending on the movie. And we can get those happy endings more when we intervene early and aggressive. And fortunately, now we have safer and better tolerated options, so we have to try them. Thank you all for your contributions to this discussion. On behalf of our panel, we thank you for joining us, and we hope you found this peer exchange discussion to be useful and informative. In closing, I would want to say it's been an honor to be your moderator for this session and be on this panel with such esteemed colleagues, and we're very lucky to have each and every one of you helping end these diseases and treat them properly, so thank you. Thank you. I do